No. January seventeenth. <laughs> oh, it's been a year. Um, January seventeenth, Energy and Climate Action Committee meeting. Um, I will be your host this evening with Lori traveling, and we, I believe, will start with um, review of the minutes, uh, public comment, and then I'd like to, after those two, maybe we ad adjust the agenda a little and meet Michael, who I think I don't know, is maybe a new yeah. member of the group, which is super exciting. But if we get through those two items, and then we can give that a little bit of space. That should sure. be my proposal. Would you like so me quick, to share the minutes, share my screen? That you're welcome to, yeah. That sounds great. Okay. I'm happy to as I'm well. No, I'm just, I was closing something else here. out, sorry. So I will share, so you should be seeing that now. Actually, these, you know what? That, that's right. I think the date is wrong at the top, so I'll, I'll adjust that. Oh. <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. So I'll adjust the date, but I but, think the yeah. minutes themselves are correct. And it appears that the next person in line is Lori to do the minutes, and then after that, we're looping back around to Dwayne. I'm good. Um, got yeah, it? yeah uh, it's going to take me a second to get uh, booted up here, but yes, I will take care of that. No rush. Thank you. Um, You know what? I'm sorry. I apologize. I just realized this is the wrong set of minutes. Can you just give me one second? Um, this was the draft, but I usually edit them. So I'm going to stop sharing a second. I apologize. Just give me one minute. No, no, right. In the, in the interim, I think everyone's had these. You sent out the minutes. I did. And I, I'm hoping I sent you the right one. I may not have. Um, Hold on, just give me one second and I will just let me know if this is the set you have. It should be. These were corrected. So this is what you should have mm -hmm. received. And if it isn't, then just review these as I scroll. Okay. It looks different because what we received was labeled December 3rd at the very top. Okay, so I accidentally sent you the uncorrected draft. So these are the this is the draft you should have received. Um, so I will repost this and send this, but this is the one you should approve or not. Do you recollect if there were any significant edits? No, it was m more just um, sort of formatting and okay. um, primarily.
new one feeling courageous to uh, move to accept the minutes. Steve. Yes, I will move to accept the minutes as they are. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Fantastic. Who is that? Sorry. It's me, Don. 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 Don, Don it is. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I will need a voice vote. So if you can have yourself unmuted and I think everyone has their cameras on um, in no particular order to the motion was to approve the minutes. Roof? Aye. Allison? Yes. Selman? Yes. Michael, is it Ising or Ising or I just want to uh, say it properly. It's Ising. Ising? Okay. Ising? Uh, aye. Breger? Yes. D? Yes. Drucker? Obscene. Okay. And the minutes are approved. Fantastic. Um, I see Lydia and Martha are here. Um, if anyone has a comment, there we go. Um, Stephanie will let you in. Yep. Martha, you can go ahead and unmute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Just wanted to say that I was glad to see the letter to the editor about not idling your vehicle that was published. And I wondered if that also was sent out as a parent's letter from the schools. I don't think yet, but we're 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 scheming all kinds of ways to send that letter out yes. or to reference the, the, the op-ed in a letter. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, and Lydia, you can go ahead and unmute. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Lydia Vernon Jones. I'm an Amherst resident. And um, I just realized that you were having the meeting today, so I didn't get a chance to send you a letter <clears throat> issue, but I'll, I'll just kind of put my personal voice to it. Um, in meeting with the Amherst Climate Justice Alliance and some other local climate groups, um, we would like, we would love it if your committee would take it upon themselves to review what will happen if the Jones Library bids come in way over what uh, what, what the library trustees can afford. And we want to be sure that what is cut out of the library plan is not the green features for the building, which was what the trustees sold the whole plan on, was this was the only way that this could be a sustainable green building was to go with their plan. And we want to be sure that um, someone calls makes it transparent about what's getting cut out of the plan when when probably the town council will have to figure out how to come up with even more money or we'll just let it be whatever it happens to be, whatever they cut out of that. And we see that as a way of falling under your mandate in terms of um, monitoring st the sustainability of town buildings, even though this is kind of a town gown building. And I will uh, send you more about some more specifics about maybe how to find that information from the past and and uh, how to get, get the future plans. And, you know, I know some of you have championed that building and would like to see it be as green as possible. So thank you for the time today. Thanks, Lydia, for bringing that to our attention. Um, yeah, I think that'd be super helpful to get your letter so we can see when that information becomes available and discuss how we could potentially address that as a group. That's very helpful. And Happy New Year to you and Martha um, both, by the way. Nice to see you. All right. Um, we have a, a new person here. Is there any formal thing that happens if not <clears throat> stephanie i would maybe suggest um 
we take some time to introduce ourselves, knowing that we've got a 5.30, uh, we have two, three more topics to hit before 5.30, but I think it's, you know, for me, this is a human people-centered group and would be, I'd be remiss to not <clears throat> give Michael some good time here. Um, I was going to suggest actually, Jesse, that perhaps um, because this isn't on the agenda, I wasn't sure Michael was going to be attending this meeting. So perhaps you want to just give Michael an opportunity, welcome him, give him an opportunity to introduce himself, but um, maybe save this either for the end or do a more formal thing at the next meeting, because we do have another new member as well, Tony McElrath. Um, who Got will it. be joining us as well. Um, I don't, I'm uh, assuming Tony will be at the next meeting also. Um, yeah, so that I makes would... good sense to, for, so Michael would introduce himself and, but that we would do a fuller kind of meeting with new members when, when both are present next Correct. time. That makes sense. All right. Hi, Michael. Yeah, that sounds good. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, one, thanks for the opportunity to join this committee. I'm very excited about, um, you know, sp spending time with you all and helping kind of the town of Amherst in, in this capacity. Um, I moved to Amherst about three years ago um, from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so I work in the energy efficiency field an energy consulting field for commercial real estate, industrial facilities of the likes. So uh, heavily involved in the energy sector and renewable energy sector and kind of the private industry. Um, we also do, I also have experience in government work and stuff like that as well. Um, <clears throat> but my background's in mechanical engineering. Um, I have a graduate degree in energy engineering um, and I've spent kind of my whole kind of career, college, and things like that in, in, in this uh, in this arena of energy, energy efficiency, climate resiliency, um, and, and the, in those topics. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky, um, moved out to Arizona um, to start to, for, for work for the first five years, and then moved to Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, my partner is a UMass professor um, in the energy, sorry, in the civil and environmental engineering department. Um, so we moved here for her for her job, um, and I was lucky enough to continue to have my uh, current position with my company back in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, that's a little bit about me. Um, I could go on, but I think that is fantastic. Um, you're frozen, I think, for a second. So we're going to ask you to do scores of spreadsheets for us and all the calculations. If you could have it all, <laughs> figure it all out. That, that okay. sounds like a great resource to have in the group. Um, welcome right, to yeah, Amherst and to the committee and look forward to sort of integrating uh, you and Tony in further at the next meeting. All right. <clears throat> Onward with our agenda, um, updates on PACE and transportation. That's Don and then Stella. And Don, Don, you mute. are muted. Um, that was so you couldn't hear my printer go when I had to print something, but that's okay. Um, Stephanie and I talked. Um, she will be attending the Massachusetts Municipal Association conference um, later on this week on Friday and Saturday, um, where this is where she actually met up with the previous person she talked to in the department that deals with um, the new regulations in PACE. Um, she has graciously and kindly agreed to scout out uh, another person or the same person in that department and get back to me with um, just some kind of where do we go from here uh, with the department and putting together something, hopefully reviving something with the Chamber of Commerce um, 
and uh, and uh, the bid. So that's where we are. We should hear more um, next meeting or the meeting after after Stephanie um, goes to her conference this weekend. And just for the record, um, it's Mass Development is who yeah. I will be Sorry, seeking that's out. The agency, mass Development. Just for the uh, record, so it's a, it's an MMA conference, but you'll be meeting with Mass Development. Well, they there's a trade show, and Mass Development has a booth space, and that's how I connected with them last year in the first place. In fact, they flagged me down. I was just walking by, and they yelled out to me and started talking. So they were kind of way off to the side. I don't think they had a lot of traffic that that morning. So, um, but I will be seeking them out this time, and uh, we'll follow up. Awesome. Thanks, Don and, and Stephanie. Uh, Stella, is this um, a, a, a torch passing announcement? No, uh, not yet, I don't think. Okay, okay. I okay. still haven't gotten a chance to talk to Stephanie, and I still have. Um, I just did my parental leave paperwork for my like work today, uh, and I said March 4th through April 29th. Um, on that. So obviously dates subject to change and a little unpredictable, but I should be here in February. <laughs> great, great. Um, likely in all likelihood. Anyways, um, no, so that's great that the letter, that's great that the letter went out. Uh, so the next things on my list were to call the driving schools um, and see if they teach about idling and if they don't, um, see if we can talk them into it and then draft something that contains the letter like we talked about last time that can go out in parent mailings from the schools i i, I as i've said before i don't yet receive parent mailings from the schools so if anybody wants to save me some googling and if you if any of you know of like what the newsletters are that go out and who perhaps like compiles those newsletters uh, it would be useful to have email addresses. I assume it's more than one person. I assume there's different people sending out kind of uh, those FYI emails for different schools. Yeah, Stephanie. Stella, it's typically the um, the PTO groups oh, okay. that send them out. And um, so I can I can help you with that as well. I think we probably just have a standard list of who to send things to. So I can assist you um, unless Laura has some ideas too. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll look to Steve or, or Jesse from the upper school. I mean, are you guys using this new, um, the, the new this year parent square thing? I get, I see a yes from Steve. Okay, um, so Debbie, Debbie Westmoreland skins out a lot of the um, kind of like general announcements on that. Um, so she would be someone to connect with there. Cool. So I think by, by next meeting, I'll try to have a, like a little blurb intro to the letter with the letter, like a little package, publicity package. I don't know that we can send uh, to the schools and then also try to figure out exactly who, who will be sending it to, whether that's, um, it sounds like maybe Debbie Westmoreland or or PTO, PTO group emails from Stephanie. Um, yeah, there's, it's PGO and I think, and I would also and add the Victoria and the athletic departments. Right, would be yeah. Another right. really, really good one. That's, yeah. she, she manages the middle, or just no, the up, just the high school, um, I think maybe, yeah. Oh, Jesse, you had talked about Amherst like recreation too, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Being so a good um, recipient of this. Yeah, the rec department would be a great one. And that's going to be, oh, I'll just send it to you because I can't remember his name right now. The other group I'd recommend, if, sorry if it was recommended before, would be the Anrise, Amherst Sunrise Group in sort of like a peer to peer way with the high school students um, that do drive their own vehicles.
Oh, that's a really good idea. Thanks, Laura. All right. Awesome. So everyone, I think uh, everyone just kind of keep thinking of contacts and categories and groups. It'd be nice if this went out to everyone all at once. Um, and let's see, how are we doing? We've got about 36 minutes for COP28 and the solar uh, uh, planning the education series. Um, so I'm going to move it to Laura um, for that, but maybe 15 minutes. Um, am I doing my math right? We'll split it down the middle. Yeah. Does that seem I reasonable? I probably won't need that much time. So, but, okay, great. Um, yeah, happy to be back. Sorry, I've been gone for quite a while. Um, traveling for a cop and then traveling for personal reasons as well. So um, good to see everybody. Congratulations, Stella. Um, <laughs> that was fun to read in the minutes. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think what I, so I, I did attend COP. I was at the actual COP venue for two days out of the two weeks. So um, I have a very narrow personal takeaways based on the thing the events that I was participating in um and then I had an offsite some offsite meetings um so um I think what I'll do is probably share with the group a couple I mean you could google like key takeaways from cop 28 and you'll find 25 different articles with different flavors from different organizations um I can certainly share a couple that I think are are the most useful um you know i think what the the general takeaways were is, is of course folks were happy to see some talk of fossil fuel phase out in the official language it's the first time that's happened um you know some groups felt that that wasn't strong enough um other groups and feel like it's we have to be careful when we talk about fossil fuels phase out because of the developing world who have not had the ability to grow their economies on fossil fuels like the rest of us have. Um, and so, um, and then of course, it, the, the beginning of COP was overshadowed with a lot of concern about the oversized impact the oil and gas industry was going to have on the COP in general. So I think all those things considered, the fact that there was, that that was included in the final text is is important um it's a big step forward i think people were pleasantly surprised with that outcome um there was a lot of talk about nature which i think was one of and water which i think that's the first time that a lot of that has been at kind of elevated at a higher level um it was the first time they had a day on gender at cop um that happened to be the day that i was there so that was interesting to hear um you know, I think most of us are aware that, you know, women are are at the front lines of many of, of, of these climate impacts um, in general. We're, we're the ones who have to kind of, I think the one woman I heard speak made this really good point that like, even in a disaster, women are the ones putting, still have to put food on the table. We still have to do all of these tasks. Um, and and so, you know, there's, we're the ones who are, are getting impacted. Um, and we're also the crisis managers in many situations. So that was, a, that was an interesting conversation. Um, whether it has any real impact is, is unknown, of course. Um, there was, um, Let me think what else to say. Maybe I'll pause there and, and see if, if there's any questions um, or if anybody else has heard things that they want to reflect on. Yeah, Jesse. I'm just curious um, what the atmosphere, like the energy was. I mean, it's Dubai. I've never been to Dubai, it sounds. And specifically, like, 
was there optimism was there anger like what was and maybe there was both but i don't know if you can speak at all to this sort of like the energy of of the group or groups and in and, and a little about the place yeah that's a great a great point dubai is an interesting place i had never been there either has anybody been there just to the airport. <laughs> Just to the airport. <laughs> um, it the positives I would say is that the public transit was quite good. Um, it was all the es elevators and escalators worked, which is not something you can say about most public transportation in the U.S. Um, it the event was at the Expo 2020 Center, which was kind. It's kind of I would describe it as Disney World without anything fun in it. Like there was no rides, thing, but it was this very expansive area um, that they built for the world, the Expo 2020, which they ended up having I think in 2021. Um, and so they had built the train line out to to that space but around that space was pretty barren like there wasn't a lot of th of things right around the expo center um i think there was a ton of people there so it was a great a good place to have it and this and, and the fact that they had this big center was helpful um they have a, a blue zone and a green zone so the blue zone is where like all the official negotiations happen and the green zone is kind of open to anybody um, so that created kind of a we weird dynamic. Like one day I had a blue zone pass um, and the other day I didn't. And there's like a, there's a literal wall. And like in some places you can see the people on the other side of the wall, but you can't go to that side of the wall if you don't have the right pass. So that was kind of a strange dynamic. Um, I've never been to a cop before. I heard from other people in attendance that like, there definitely was less protests and less things at this one, probably. I mean, I know because of um, kind of crackdowns on that kind of stuff. So I think there was less expression of, you know, less expression in that way, I would say, than probably at previous cops. Um, the atmosphere, I was there kind of earlier in the week and the atmosphere was a little bit, and that was when a lot of the news was breaking about like there was this other situation where the president of the cop kind of dismissed the science of climate and dismissed Mary Robinson, who is a, a very well known and beloved by many uh, leader. And so that was kind of what was the atmosphere when I was there, just sort of like like I went to a session where John Kerry and David Turk, I believe, who's the um one one below the department of energy head head person um who's kind of like the science is clear you know so that was kind of the message that was going to, to counter that that narrative um i do think people thought it was going to be a hu a complete bust and so i think again i think people were feeling like okay it wasn't a complete bust it did um move the conversation forward on fossil fuels I think the general sense is that we're moving in the slowly in the right direction, not at the scale or speed that we need to be at any level, local all the way up to national and and global. Um, and there's a lot of headwinds in terms of misinformation campaigns, in terms of you know um, anti ESG in the U.S. You know, there's a lot of things happening that are trying to slow slow progress continue to keep the progress slow they do have tim horton in dubai which i thought was the weirdest thing that was my weirdest takeaway <laughs> i'll leave that out of the minutes but interesting <laughs> fact um i just had just your, your um uh you raised the, the issue about women and uh, uh, and their role and uh, and their important role. Just, I, I read recently that the next, they're you know they're already obviously planning the next COP meeting. Um, and at least from what I heard, there is not one woman on that planning committee. Um, and I think it's in another um, 
country, uh, I forget what country it's in, uh, but that don't have strong women rights. Mm -hmm. very, yeah, it's very disappointing. I mean, it's not just the role they play, but their 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 um, importance in decision making and and uh, the diversity of decision making processes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 As Azerbaijan. Don't know too much about it, but so. <laughs> yeah. I had to look it up on the map when they announced it. I was like, where is this? <laughs> Typical American, not knowing. I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, any other questions, comments, additions? Sounds like an amazing, like a, I mean, just the eye opening. Can't imagine. I mean, I, looking at the pictures of the Expo 2020, it's, that's where you're talking about climate. All right. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Laura, I just wondered personally if it left you feeling more hopeful or more discouraged. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it's always good to connect with people that are doing doing the work in different ways. And so in that sense, it, it made me feel hopeful. Like I was able to have conversations with folks, um, that made me on some, like on some specific topics related to my work on corporate climate action, where I was feeling a little bit like, wait a minute, am I in a twilight zone? Like what's happening? And like to have, be able to talk to people in real life and be like, no, I think the same thing you think. Like that part was helpful for me personally. Um, I think having so many people, yeah. So I think that, I think I definitely left more hopeful than I thought I was going to leave. Whether I was like fully hopeful, I don't, I can't, I don't know. But if, if that makes sense, like I thought I was going to go there and leave really depressed and I didn't leave really depressed. <laughs> so that's great to know. I just wondered um, if you had a chance to see that article I shared with everyone at the beginning of the month. Um, I forget who the author was, but she was sort of talking about how she sort of went into the year sort of feeling like everyone's going to die from climate change and then felt like that's not going to happen. And and she wasn't saying that it's not an urgent need to address it, but just encouraging us that what we are doing is having an impact. And we have more to do, obviously, but we shouldn't feel so defeated that it's not having, it's not doing anything, that these efforts are cumulatively working to have some impact. And, and especially here in the US, I was encouraged to hear about the 20% reduction, which I I would have answered negatively. I think that was her question to folks and people all answered negatively as I would have as well. So it was encouraging to hear what she had to say. So I just wondered if it was sort of, if you felt that that was probably an accurate assessment or, and if you didn't have a chance to read it, that's fine. I just wondered if you thought that was an accurate assessment given where you just came off the COP28. I just wondered, is, does that jive with what you experienced there? Yeah, no, I didn't have, I didn't, I wasn't checking my email when I was on vacation and therefore I just have a lot of unread emails, but I will look up that one and read it because that sounds really interesting. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think where we are now, per, my personal opinion is where we are now versus where we are, were a few, a few years ago, the headwinds are that we mostly know where we need to go. We have the pathways and we're, and we're, and we're moving down those pathways. We're just not quite moving fast enough or at the scale we need. So it's different than maybe five or 10 years ago where the pathways still felt very unclear. Um, so in that sense, yeah, like we know where we're going. We just need to move a lot faster and a lot quicker. Um, and that feels good. Like that feels like a, a problem that's solvable versus a problem that seems kind of, more difficult. I think where on the flip side, I think there's more and more pressure to slow down that is coming from areas that we're not even quite aware of, like the whole anti-ESG movement, for example, like that kind of came out of left field and is slowing stuff down when we don't need to be slowing down. 
um, right now there's a lot of chatter in the news about EVs and how Americas aren't ready for EVs and EVs aren't making enough money. And it's like hard to know how much of that is coming from real sources of information, right? Um, and that's the part that I start to feel like that's what's bothering me right now is just like um, the attempts to just slow things, to continue to slow things down. And some of that, or maybe some truth in that, and there's probably some non-truth in some of that stuff. And that's happening across the whole space right you mean um, lies yes, yes lies or just like misrepresentation or like how does that compare to america's purchasing <clears throat> of all cars like is it you know like there's it's pulling data out to you you can do a lot i love data and you can also use data to tell whatever story you want to tell right so yeah. um anyway well, it's always about considering the source. <laughs> exactly. And the sources are getting sneakier and sneakier to find. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's actually a question I, I had. You you mentioned misinformation and misinformation campaigns and something I've been trying to keep an eye on a little bit. I don't, you know, seen a lot of things come my way that are just like seem to be sort of climate denying, very active climate denying um literature do you have a resource like a, that you go to you're like all right if if i need to make a point i go to you know something like that or is or did this did anything emerge from this that was like kind of like a a fact check if you will like a current fact check. or if if you did come across it i think that'd be a great thing to share with this group and our listeners martha yeah yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Uh, something, and um, others probably have thoughts as well on, on this. Um, you know, I think it's it's more about what what I'm where I'm seeing it come from is is more like there's a news article about EV sales, or there's a news article about the offshore wind and how the New Jersey project, you know, got failed or whatever you want to call it. Right. And like always taking that into context of like, well, how many offshore winds projects have, have not failed? What's the percentage? Oh, actually this one is not, or these two that failed, you were not talking about the eight that passed and that's a, you know, or went through. So like trying to put it all in context is something that I think um, is something I'm working on because I think that that's where it's, it's it's like reputable media sources. It's not that the media source is not reputable. It's the, it's that, it's a headline that's got click bait potential <laughs> that is telling a story that seems benign but then I see those stories be used by investors, be used by companies, by used by people that actually have to move as a reason not to move as quickly. So that's what, I guess that's what I mean by, maybe it's not misinformation as much as it's just that, you know, every story we tell, like these stories that we tell that seem benign are actually having a real impact on slowing progress. Yeah, that's the steady, this, this, the way things are sp spun. Um, yeah. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Okay, it's helpful. I guess it's just along those lines, just my own experience outside of COP, obviously, but is um, it's just always frustrating when, you know, they talk about, okay, heat, heat pumps are very expensive, EVs are very expensive, offshore winds has all sorts of problems getting going. And, and the story about climate is not like, how are these projects and these technologies working today? It's how do we um, use, how do we accelerate and, and get to get through this initial stage of market buildup so that we can get to um, the price points and the um, uh, maturity of the industry that we need in 10 years. Uh, it's always gonna be hard getting started, 
a new industry and new technologies, but you got to invest in that to get over the hump and, and into uh, where, where these uh, electric vehicles and heat pumps are, are the status quo. Um, and, uh, you know, disinformation that EVs are, are, um, are expensive. So why bother is missing the point <laughs> of, of, uh, of what we need to do as a society to move forward. Yeah, exactly, Dwayne. I think that's exactly right. And we're in the like status quo bias that we have. Like, like yeah, it's not going to start and be a perfect industry. <laughs> like, that's not how things work. There was a uh, last point I'll make because you reminded me of it, and then we can move on to the next uh, type topic. There was a really interesting. I went to a uh, Atlantic Council forum, and there was a really good um, session on kind of like how to how to make financing a big a big focus was finance flow and how to get financing flowing from developed countries and private and private sector into developing countries and there was a guy up there from JP Morgan he was asked what's the role of banking and closing the financing gap and he gave a lot of talking points blah blah, blah you know blah blah um it's a it's not a financing problem it's a project development gap we need um you know we need good projects kind of like focusing on the need for good projects and the woman on the stage from the Atlantic Council actually she gave her response I thought was quite provocative um you know she was basically like you're saying all the, these are all the words you're saying but you're holding if you want a regulatory environment to be perfect before investing in it, we would have never invested in the expansion of the US West, for example, or any other, you know, like we're holding these projects to a level of scrutiny that we would have never, when we're talking about just expanding and growing and trying to make money, our, our level of comfort is much different than these projects that still for some reason to some people feel like a nice to have or an extra or like a bird, like kind of just like not a place where we need to be focused if we're focused on making money. Right. So, um, you know, that was, I think that applies to all of this. Like we are, we're applying this level of certainty and ROI on things that maybe don't have an ROI because we can't put all of this into financial terms and, I know that's not what the bankers want to hear, but that's the reality of the situation. I love that point. I think it's a perfect segue <laughs> into our next um, topic, which maybe <clears throat> is also your topic, Laura, um, though you may not be as prepared for it. But yeah, that idea of what, you know, why do we hold certain things to this very high standard of uh, what's the payback? No one ever asks, like, what's the payback on their pants or a vacation or cabinets? It's only energy for some reason has has to has to pay for itself. That your house is comfortable or secure, better indoor air quality. Does not matter. Um, so we have our ne Greg is slated to start at 530 yep. and we have we have a discussion right before that. Uh, that's called Solar Continued Discussion and Planning of Educational Series Development Regarding Solar on the Built Environment. And I, I think in fairness to people who may be joining us from the public to see Greg, I want to make you wait until 530. Um, however, if you, I think it would be fair for you to weigh in on this conversation. We are trying to figure out who's next. We've got, you are going to speak in Oh, Stephanie. Sorry, I have an update on that, actually. So oh, you can continue speaking to Greg, but I do have a, a quick update. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I think it's, I'm not sure what this represents in the agenda. So we have 10 minutes, basically, for this topic. Stephanie. Um, this definitely will not take 10 minutes. So we can definitely then defer to Greg. Um, but we were just talking about um, securing some speakers, actually for a few series and different topics. And so I connected with um, Sunbug Solar and they were going to, um, they agreed to come and speak at a future meeting and they were going to discuss um, 
electric vehicle charging and also um, parking lot canopies as well. We had sort of talked about, again, the built environment. So I think those two topics are things that they are going to address. And they can come in February, either the um, second or or the first or second meeting in February. That's great. That's great. And I think the overall, just to remind ourselves, this really stemmed, I think, from a comment you made, Laura, which was, let's shift the conversation to the type of PV projects we all can agree are good projects that aren't going to be met with a lot of controversy. And like, let's, let's prioritize the positive on that. Um, so I will open it if people have comments about anything anyone's been up to on that topic or not. Steve. This is not a big lead, but there is a um, governor's commission, the commission to accelerate siting and permitting of clean energy infrastructure. And that was established back in September, I believe. And it's supposed to be having some kind of results or report out a little bit later this spring, um, February or March, I'm not sure. I've poked around and I haven't found much information on the mass.gov website. And I, I could not find a source of agendas or minutes. Um, I haven't explored exclusively, but I guess my question is one, if, if anybody else in the committee here knows of that commission and their work, and possibly if that's something we could get somebody involved with that to speak, I think it would be wonderful to hear um, what's happening and whether there's an opportunity for uh, input to that process. Dwayne, is that anything that you are aware of? The Commission to Accelerate Siting and Permitting of Clean Energy Infrastructure? Yep. Sorry, I was looking for the mute button. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have heard of it. Um, I think um, I'm pretty, I, I I know of at least one person who was assigned or, or um, what is it called, uh, asked to be part of it. Um, uh, so I know it's it's kind of it, it's a thing. I don't know if the full commission has been um, seated yet uh, or appointed, um, and I I don't know anything about whether they have a an agenda or time frame yet. So I don't I don't really have too much in, info. Okay. Yeah, I think it was seated back in September. And there is a list online of the people who are members of it. Um, but yeah, okay. All right, well, I'll dig around some more and see if um, if I can find anything that might be useful for us. The, the other thing that people might be of interest, it was mentioned at our last meeting, and that's the forum that Mass Audubon is sponsoring this coming Monday evening in the Bangs Community Center. Um, it was in our minutes. I forget the exact title of it, but that's, I, I think they'll be promoting their proposal for policy changes to support more solar on rooftops and canopies um, going forward. So that should be an interesting event Monday. Um, just to follow up on that. Um, so um, yeah, so that that event is happening Monday the twenty second, from six to seven thirty at the Bangs Community Center, and I am actually now going to be part of that panel, uh, representing the town. So um, that just transpired last week. <laughs> so, um, but yes, I was going to send you all the information, but I encourage you to attend because it will be a very interesting discussion, and I think um, Joe Comerford is going to be there. I think um, Rep. Mindy Dom, I think, is going to facilitate, and there's going to be others that um, I think will be you'll be interested in hearing from. Do we know who organized that event? Mass Audubon. Right. And I think this is in connection with their study. 
that they released. And yes, I that think... study, I just found it here, that study is called Growing Solar Protecting Nature. And I believe you can find that online. It's a pretty detailed study that was released um, this fall, October 2023. Um, pretty detailed study with quite a bit of analysis in it. Um, I haven't looked at it recently. It may have been updated. And I expressed some of my concerns at our previous meetings about just some way some of the things were framed in that report. But so, I'm looking forward to their policy proposals. Yes. And um, they are holding these forums, I guess, um, around the state. Ah. So they are actually, they've take, they're taking it on the road, as they told me. <laughs> and actually, Michelle Man Mannion, I think, who's the rep from yes. Mass Audubon, who's going to be leading this, I believe her name is on the list of people on that commission for um, accelerate siting and permitting of clean energy infrastructure. So perhaps we can ask her during that presentation what's happening on that commission. So, Jesse, if you want, I can, um, I don't have a lot of updates, so I could very quickly, um, we have five minutes and I can give a very quick staff update unless you want to have more conversation about this topic. That sounds like a great idea. Get us okay. your five minutes. <laughs> okay. Again, it probably won't take me that long. So I already um, gave you the update about the solar forum that's coming up on the 22nd. Um, also, just a reminder that the um, DPU is here having their hearing, public hearing about the community choice aggregation uh, also on Monday, the 22nd, busy day. Um, that's going to be at 2 p.m. Uh, that will not, it, it's uh, only a few people from the aggregation, the proposed aggregation are going to actually be speaking, uh, one from each community. I'll be speaking on behalf of Amherst. Um, but the hearings are not very long. Uh, I was told that they're usually about all of 15 minutes. They have a, a full docket. Uh, the, the DPU has a full docket that day. And so it's really just a kind of, you know, opportunity for for the communities to sort of express their support for moving this project forward, but it doesn't have a lot of weight. It won't really have a whole lot of weight in terms of the decision making by the DPU. So, um, so again, that that's happening on on Monday as well. Um, Valley Bike Share. There was recently an article. Uh, in the Gazette, which I was surprised to see myself quoted. <laughs> so um, that was kind of um, shocking, but um, because I hadn't been interviewed. So, um, but we are trying to move that effort forward again. That's going to be, um, we're going to be having more discussion. We have an RFP that's released. The deadline is the 31st. We'll be reviewing proposals and um, hopefully being able to at least get this season moving forward. Um, so feeling more optimistic, it's not, um, I wouldn't say that we have everything locked in and secured for the long-term longevity of the program, but at least for now, we're hoping to at least get this season moving forward. So that was, um, I'm kind of hopeful and optimistic about that. Otherwise, um, it's budget season working on on that piece um uh we had to get sort of prelim preliminary information in but i haven't heard anything there's been no hearings or anything yet so um i have asked for an increase in funding for sustainability um but you know i that's just i can ask for the sky but it doesn't mean we're getting it so it's just you know the beginnings um beginning of those discussions. So that's um, primarily it. I don't have a whole lot more to to update you on today, other than I did mention that we do have, um, you know, we're welcoming Michael today and we do have Tony McElrath who will be joining us hopefully at the next meeting as our next new member. Fantastic. Sammy, is there is there a new Sean yet? No, so no, we have we do not have a new finance director yet. Um, I believe the search is ongoing, but I haven't heard anything that we're close yet. So, um, but yes. 
very missed. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. All right, we are, we've got um, some folks are starting to appear in the um, in the uh, attendee booth. That's great. Um, I think we'll hold for one more minute. Um, anyone have anyone have a uh, a quick ECAC member update that takes one minute? Dwayne seems to have gotten much younger. Do you have any comments, Alden? No. No comments. Okay, sorry. Hi, Alden. You're famous. All right. Well, I think we can start the process of introducing this next um, piece. This is part of our ongoing um, education series, which is really, I think, is a, you know, Vasu was a great pioneer of this, and then Lori, <clears throat> who's a excuse me, away. So just, you know, all of us, but I think the two of them really have consistently sort of pushed for this education series to happen. I think it's wonderful um, for all of us sort of use, use this space, use this forum to, to bring, bring this to ourselves and to people. Stephanie, do you have an introduction at all prepared? Because I could, I could muster one if not. Uh, I, you, I'm going to let you take the lead. I have plenty I could say about Greg and our partnership <laughs> for the Solarize program. Um, but I, I'll let but I you... can also introduce myself. Yes. I'm, I'm fine <laughs> introducing myself. So all right, go for first it. of all, thank you for the invitation. Dwayne, it's great to see you. It's been a long time. I hope you and your family are well. Uh, Stephanie, thank you. Thanks, um, Greg. And good to see you, Greg. Yeah. Uh, I'm Greg Garrison. Uh, I'm the president and owner of Northeast Solar. Um, we're a solar installation company, primarily based for residential, agricultural, and and some commercial work. Uh, we're based in Hatfield, Massachusetts. We've been around for about 13 years. I came to the solar industry through uh, GCC, who had a renewable energy program that started in around 2008. Uh, it was funded by the Commonwealth Corporation when that admission in the state was really focused on pushing renewable energy. And um, I took their associate's program there after selling my past business, which was mainly uh, focused on burning gas to make money um, and transitioned into this environment. I have an enormous carbon debt to repay and I'm working on it every day. So um, I come to this uh, in a long way. I met Stephanie through the Solarize Amherst program, uh, which was a lot of fun and we did a lot of work there and uh, been primarily focused on the residential market. And they asked me to come here today to talk a little bit about you know solar financing and how do people get solar on their homes and you know, what are the different options, et cetera. Um, but I'll start the conversation with saying that, you know, in in our instance, in my instance particularly, because in the days that Duane was a part of the Mass CC and other organizations, and we were primarily focused on where does the energy dollars go? It's not just about the green energy, but also about where does the energy dollars go? So we spend, the state spends an enormous amount of money on energy every year, powering and fueling their homes for heating, cooling, electrical, et cetera. And if we can retain more of that money into the state, the state does better economically. So when we look at the financing options for solar, we look at them in a sense about where does the money go? And how does it benefit the homeowner? And how does it benefit the local community? So there are primarily I would say five ways to finance solar. There's the direct purchase, which is just writing the check for amount of the solar. There's financing, where you come up with some type of financing package, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that. There's PACE financing, which really hasn't gotten any legs. 
um, yet, and we can talk a little bit more about that. There's leasing and there's power purchase agreements. And I'll start back at the top, which is there's, you, it was said earlier in the conversation that you guys are having about people think about energy as a payback. And what Duane was saying about how people look at the wind projects and everything that's going on now and they're saying, where's the payback? Where's the payback? All this energy dollars are going up. I can tell you that when I started installing solar in Massachusetts, we were selling solar at around $10 a watt, which would mean if you put a 10 kilowatt hours, 10 kilowatt system on your house, it would cost a hundred thousand dollars. But the state subsidized that through rebates, different incentives, and of course they had the federal tax credit, which would reduce that cost down substantially. But what it did, it was it accelerated the marketplace substantially. You had a lot of big players coming in, primarily with PPAs and leases, but they came in on a big way. And what it's done is we're currently selling solar at about 290 a watt in just a little over 10 years. And that's what drives the energy dollar down. So now the solar market is a very, you know, it's a very competitive market, um, but it's a more cost effective market for the homeowner. So when you're talking about payback, um, which is still the primary driver of solar, it's a little bit easier to look at. So what we look at when we look at financing, if you're looking at a direct purchase, somebody's going to say, here's a $20,000 system, and they're going to write a check. So what does that payback look like for the customer? Is that you've got your federal tax credit of 30%, and then you have net metering, and another thing we call RECs, which are renewable energy credits. There was an SREC market, which is sole renewable energy credits, but that has expired. It probably will never come back. And there was a program called SPART, uh, through the state, but that is pretty much expired for residential because there's no value in it. So most homeowners on a direct purchase can look to pay back their system currently at the current prices in seven to ten years. Uh, seven to ten years, depending on how much solar radiation they get on a daily basis. What the benefit of that is is that there is that upfront cost. There's that big expenditure that comes out, but for the next 10 to 15, 20 years, because most of these systems now, most of the systems we sell, well, actually all the systems we sell now, on components have a 25 year warranty. So for the next 15 years, if everything maintains itself, um, that is all revenue that comes back to the homeowner. That's no more electric bills or significantly reduced electric bills, depending on how much they consume. Um, and that money comes back to the homeowner. And what we think that is uh, the absolute plus, because those dollars that they're not spending on their electric bill will typically get spent somewhere else. Maybe it's a dinner out, maybe it's some movies, maybe some time with the kids and family, but that money gets spent somewhere else in the community. And that's how we look at it. We look at that expenditure and where it goes. The next option typically is financing. And there's different financing options. And this is where I would caution anybody that, you know, was listening to this webinar or thinking about it, is that what happened in the solar industry about two years ago was people who deal in financing. Think about these used cars financing options, which have really high interest rates or really high dealer fees, moved into the solar market in a way where they actually started solar companies so they could push their financing. So they came into the solar industry to install solar, but really to push their financing. So what we do uh, and what some of the companies do in the area is that we lose, use only local financing options. You can either take a home equity loan, which is probably a good benefit now considering the interest rates because of the deductibility, but we use like, uh, UMass 5 Credit Union, which um, has a solar loan project. And we use that because we know that because when you're paying those dollars back in, that money still accelerates in the local community. So we prefer that type of financing. 
and then we use local community banks. So as much as we can keep those energy dollars local, that's what we prefer to do. And that option is probably more available to most people than they realize. The current interest rates are not favorable, but there is still a payback. You're you're done paying your system off in 10 years, and you still have that 15 years to go through with no strings attached. The next option is that PACE financing I talked about, which hasn't been developed, which we all would hope that would come around at some point. And PACE financing essentially assigns the value of the solar array to your property taxes, and then you pay an ex in a, an addition on your property taxes to pay back that solar installation. This is a very clean way of doing it. It's a very cost-effective way of doing it. It keeps all the monies back in the community, obviously. But PACE hasn't gotten past the point where local banks and mortgage companies are comfortable with being secondary to a PACE loan in case the, uh, any types of bankruptcy or anything went out. So PACE has had a hard time getting started. There are some commercial PACE options available out there, but nothing for the residential market. And I would hope that at some point, and maybe this current administration would be able to push it through, uh, PACE would be a real option because that really for local communities uh, would be the best option. The next two options are not direct ownership options. They are ownership options by the financing companies. So one is a lease where you lease the system from the company. You still get all the benefits of the net metering, depending on the contract. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and some of the renewable energy credit benefits, but you pay a flat rate every month to the owner of the solar array that's attached to your house. And like the lease arrangement, PPAs are the similar thing. It's a third party ownership where somebody else owns the array on your house and you pay them for the electricity that it generates. And what they do is they typically give you a certain percentage or uh, a few dollar or a few cents off your electric usage. So if you're 20 cents a kilowatt hour to use rounds numbers, they may sell you the power at 16 cents. So you save four cents a kilowatt hour, but they still own the system and they still own the benefits of the system. That model, those two last models, export all the energy dollars that come from solar outside of the state into the financing companies. And they have an income generating property that's attached to your home. With that, and it depends on every company's got a different, not every company's got a pretty much a different arrangement. So there's rules against the transfer of ownership. So if you want to sell your house and you have this property attached to your house, the new owners either have to assume the lease or assume the PPA agreement, or you have to buy it out before you can transfer the home. So they control the transfer of the home before until they're made whole, essentially, on their agreement with you. Now, for some people, these arrangements seem pretty good because there's no upfront cost. There's no maintenance. Um, and the maintenance means if something breaks, obviously, they're going to fix it because it's an investment property. People want their investments to be returned, so they want to make sure it's operating 100%, so they'll take care of the maintenance. But there can be provisions on the production of the system, which means if when you had your system installed, you had a small little maple in your front yard, and five years later, it's a large maple tree <laughs> and shading more to the property, they may require you to remove the tree or trim it to get the production up to where it needs to be. And, and there may be some requirements to make sure that that production stays consistent. So in those ways, it's it's beneficial for the homeowner to have a system that they don't have to pay for, but there isn't a lot of economic benefit to them or 
to the local community. So one of the things in our company is we don't offer any PPA or leases because we don't feel that they're, we know that they're not good for the consumer. And also they're not good for the local community. The energy dollars are still leaving the state. There's no financial benefit to, besides the green attributes, to that solar array being installed on a residential home. It's it becomes a financial model. In the financing picture, it gets a little bit more, it can get a little bit more complicated for the homeowner. So as I mentioned, we use just local banks. It's pretty straightforward. You finance it, there's a payment, there's an interest rate, and you just do that. Sometimes, because of the payment currently with the interest rates, your payments can be more than your current electric bill. So you're actually paying more money on a regular basis than you would be if you just paid your electric bill. And for a lot of people, that's like, well, when they look at tabletop type of budgeting, they look at, well, I'm spending 150 bucks a month now on my electric, but you're asking me to spend 250 bucks on a solar. Um, I need that hundred dollars a month for my budget. So I can't go with solar. So that is definitely a headwind against that. And because of that, a lot of people don't look at the long-term benefits. If they, and depending on what they want to do and what they think their permanency is in the neighborhood, if they're going to be there for five years, 10 years, 15 years, or this is their final home, that makes a lot of the decision-making process. So when they look at it long-term, after that seven to 10 years, depending on the length of term they pick, then that money flows back into them. And there is definitely a payback on that. And there's definitely a benefit to them long term. The return on the investment is typically about, even with the current interest rates, about 5%. The same thing you get for a very high CD. So it's still there. They just have to look at it objectively in that way. Some of the financing options that are out there also with financing companies, and this is where solar has kind of gotten this wild west kind of the old school i think they called them the uh the aluminum siding guys where they'd come up and sell you anything quickly on a quick finance model um these financial products are designed to match or beat your current electrical rate so they'll come in with a financing package and say oh your current bill is you know 150 bucks a month well i can get you in solar on this financing package for 100 ten dollars a month or less or equal to but what they don't realize is that these these loans are typically 20 years almost the lifetime of the system and they have substantial dealer fees so currently the dealer fees on these financing models are 30 percent which means if you're buying a twenty thousand dollar system you're going to add 30 percent to that and you're financing that also so essentially you're paying a lot more for that financing than you would originally. So if you decide to pay it off early, you're still paid off. You, they still made their money on it. So these are substantially different. And for the consumer, it's important to say, for a consumer to look at it and say, what is the cost of my system? I don't want to know what my monthly payment is. Tell me how much my system costs, how much you're going to, how much it costs if I paid it cash, and how much am I financing? Because that can be substantially different. So it's important for the consumer to be able to look at these financing options and look at it and say, okay, so here's my monthly payment, but I want to break it down into what is my actual purchase cost versus my finance cost to disclose some of that. Because in the way that they the solar industry is currently not our company, but some of the other companies that are out there is currently structured is to have a very fast sales cycle. You click on a web link, you reach out to the, the company and they're, the current models are designed to have somebody contact you very quickly. We can now do designs. We can pull up your address uh, very quickly and there's a couple of different softwares and yes, AI is involved in this also now. 
um, that can detail your roof, lay out the solar array, estimate the production, create a financing package and everything within minutes, send it to you in a web link where you can scroll through in the presentation and just by clicking a few boxes, get all the way to purchasing. So it's kind of, I, I think about it as a hallway with a series of lights. And as you walk down the hallway, they keep turning on lights. So you keep following it down until you get to the end or a series of yeses to where you can actually say yes enough times so you finally say yes at the end. And that's the way the market has kind of gone. So when consumers are looking at what solar can do for them or why they would want to go solar, they have to think about what their priorities are. Um, do they want to save on the electric bill? What is it they want long-term for their home? They have to look at it as a, a long-term energy improvement. Um, I myself, obviously, I have solar on my home. I also have storage and I also have air source heat pumps. <laughs> so, you know, I've, you know, I've kind of got the whole package and I can tell you that in my example, when you actually go through it, and even though it was an expense for me also, like it would be for anybody else, net benefit to me is much greater. It's a, it's a much greater package. And I would encourage the, the consumer who's out there looking at solar to consider one, why they're doing it. If they're just looking to eliminate the electrical bill, if they're looking at an investment, if they're looking at the long-term, as I did, I looked at it as a long-term kind of security for my home. Um, I don't have to worry about energy bills that much. I don't have to worry about fuel bills that much. I don't want to worry about energy scarcity that much. Um, there's a lot of different conversations that can have around that. And to make sure that whenever they are presented with a package, that they review it and look through it carefully. And the leasing documents or the PPA documents, uh, even the financing documents can be multiple pages. Um, we're talking in excess of 25 to 30 pages of agreements because there's a lot of stuff in there to, for their investors to make sure they're made whole on this. So we always encourage people to look at this in a very open-minded and very questioning state um, and to make sure that they, when they move forward, they understand fully what the benefits will be to them. Overall, the adoption of solar in our communities, we believe is a net benefit. The more energy dollars we capture, the better it is for our communities. Better for the households, it's better for the overall community. What the utility has to come up to speed with is the fact that we may be generating more power than they need, especially during the summer times, than they can actually physically use because you get this surge of power that comes out of all these solar arrays into the grid that they, you know, just really can't be used effectively. Um, in California had this issue. And in California, they dealt with it uh, by establishing the new metering policy, which is called 3.0. And essentially what they did is they significantly reduced the amount of benefit they get from net metering which essentially crashed the solar industry because California was a leader. Uh, solar sales in California are down 80%. Um, some of the largest companies that provide solar equipment like Enphase, Solar Edge, REC panels, QCell panels, all the major brands have had significant financial difficulty because that market has just collapsed. But it, that was the result of a utility or an administration that decided that um, they needed to curtail the economic benefit of where that economic benefit went. Did it go to the homeowner? Did it go to the utility? Um, so currently in our state, we have a very pro-solar group. There are some discussions about siting, and those are very valid discussions, and I've sat on a lot of those seminars and webinars about that. Um, but essentially for residential solar, there's 
really a mandate out there currently. And what we're trying to do is find the best way to make, to, to drive people to that benefit, which is putting solar on your roof and hopefully air source heat pumps also. Uh, we install air source heat pumps also. It's kind of a package deal because we can do both the solar and the air source heat pumps. So when you install the air source heat pumps, the solar will offset the electrical expense and the additional expense on that. And essentially you're, you're coming out pretty neutral, but it's a kind of a mandate that the state has set up. And we feel very fortunate to be in a state like this, but it really matters to the consumer how they purchase it, whether they go with a direct purchase or whether they go with a third party purchase. So, and I've rattled on there quite a bit, so I'll stop for a minute and see if anybody else has got any questions. I have a question. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer it. I'm um, maybe Steve or Dwayne can answer it. Of of these options, of these ways to finance and um, a solar project, is there a carbon difference? And and I can imagine um, to to use Rex or not to use Rex is probably I'm guessing is the big one. But is there a is there an emissions difference? Um, associated with any of these models as far as um so with the rec difference when you do a third party if you do third party purchasing ppa or lease the recs are automatically going to flow to them so there is no carbon benefit they we do have customers who don't elect to take the recs because they want the green attributes to stay with them and they don't want to benefit the power plants ability to purchase their green attributes. Um, and so only in the direct purchase option, is that available? And maybe in the future, maybe PACE, but from a green attribute standpoint, only direct purchase has the best carbon benefit because it's the decision of the homeowner. And right now, RECs are not a big deal. I mean, a year's worth of RECs are maybe $300 to a homeowner. So it's not a big financing option or a benefit, the net metering is still the number one benefit. So if a customer elects to, and, and we inform our customers that, if they elect to keep their recs personally, then they capture all the green benefit. And I'll also say the embodied cost of most of this, most of the manufacturing because most of the manufacturers have done very good with uh, zero waste. Like Enphase has a plant in Mexico where a lot of the uh, microverters are done and it has a zero waste stream, uh, which is really great. So the embodied energy and a lot of this stuff is is captured in about five to seven years. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, it looks like Steve and then Stephanie, can you grab mm -hmm. Martha, Martha after, yeah. st after Steve? That'd be great. Thanks. Yes. I'm curious, we, we've heard some concern about the newer fire code regulations restricting the amount of solar that can fit on a roof. Um, have you experienced that? And do you have an estimate about how much that's restricting solar capacity on residential rooftops? It depends on the residential rooftop, but typically it's about 10%. Um, the NFPA weighed in on this uh, they want direct access to the roof to lay a ladder down, to climb it up, to be able to ventilate the roof, et cetera. There's a lot of um, things they haven't considered in it. Like people have metal roofs. They don't ventilate metal roofs. Um, so there's a lot of things they haven't flushed out in it. But yes, every town, including Amherst, has a very aggressive NFPA uh, requirement that we have to meet. So all of our systems have to be... Uh, put through first to the fire chief or their fire safety officer to be approved. And then we do that. But yeah, it, it reduces our capacity by about 10%. And that doesn't affect existing systems. I'm not going to have to take no. panels off my no. roof. No, okay. no. It's, it's just an all new system starting in 2023. Well, at a certain point, 2023, but definitely for 2024, we have to have at least three foot on one side and 18 inches at the ridge vent. So um, that three feet on a smaller roof 
for some homeowners, you know, if you can put six panels across and then three up, that's great. But now if you can only put five across and three up, it's a significant difference. And sometimes that's the difference between meeting the electrical expense or not meeting the electrical expense. But I will also say, we get this a lot, you know, when people come to us and say, oh, this is only going to offset, you know, 60% of my electrical use. And I go, well, solar can only do what it can do. But you know what? Who controls the electrical <laughs> use? You do. <laughs> so, you know, you ought to get it to zero. Work on that part of it. Martha, you can go ahead and unmute. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for your uh, presentation. I have, have two things. First of all, I feel a little pessimistic in terms of the costs. I mean, every public survey that I have seen shows that the main uh, obstacle to getting solar on one's rooftop is the upfront cost that a lot of people simply cannot afford $20,000, even $10,000, uh, never mind whether it's going to benefit them in the long term. And so it means a lot of lower income homeowners just are stuck, it seems to me, in the present market. Uh, I don't know whether you would agree or not. I would agree. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so that's a problem maybe for Amherst to consider or whether there's any other options. The other question I would have, and this particularly would relate to California, but overall the problem of the daytime surge in the, uh, you know, when you're doing net metering is what about battery storage? Are you doing more now with installing um, battery storage for people when you do uh, solar? We do. And, and I actually have storage in my home. But storage is also an additional cost. So you spend twenty thousand dollars for your electrical system, and then you'll spend fifteen thousand on storage. So there's an additional cost, and there are some incentives in storage. But I wasn't asked to talk about those in this proposal. Um, so the way that I use my storage is that during the day when the sun's up, my battery gets whatever energy it does, whatever energy it creates more than what I'm consuming, it stores in my battery. And then at night, like right now. Um, my house, yep, my house is still being run by my batteries. So um, right now, everything you're seeing is being run off energy I created during the day, during this daytime. And it'll, during the wintertime, I run out of energy about two o'clock in the morning and I start pulling back from the grid. But that is the benefit that we like a lot of people do. But again, uh, to your point about uh people on more fixed budgets or low income, it's a very difficult upfront expense to do. And I think this is where my personal soapbox is where PACE financing could be a huge benefit to both the community and to solar financing. In my case, we put solar panels on a decade ago uh, when they were first coming in and we did it by leasing with, with sun mm -hmm. and um, past two months of the first time in the 10 years that I have had to pay an electric bill to my utility company at all. And it's because I've recently gotten the heat pump. Yep. But, uh, so for, for me, it was very cost effective because it's, I pay 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And so instead of the 40 cents that the mm -hmm. ever source charges, but. Um, yep. Everybody has a different model. Um, ours is just focused on where the energy dollars go. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Dwayne and Laura. Yeah, great. Hi, Greg, and thanks for um, all the information uh, this evening. It's been great. Um, just a question I've always trying to have been trying to figure out. I think it's come up in this committee before as well, and that is on the on the uh, net metering policies, and I, I used to know more detail than I do today, but um, is it, if you're, um, you know, the question arises if you have a home where you could put up more solar and would like to put up more solar than what you actually use um, over the course of a year, at the residential level, are you able to then make an agreement with a neighbor or a friend or a, 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 a somebody in the, in the, 
utility territory uh, to virtually net meter, uh, sort of just person to person if, if um, you have excess space on your house? You can, those are personal agreements. Um, so you can, what's called a schedule Z in the utility yeah. language, you can say, I wanna transfer 30% of my production to this meter, which may be your neighbor. And then you would have an individual agreement with them saying, I'm gonna send you this amount of energy and I'm gonna send you a bill every month for whatever your kilowatt hour charge is gonna be. And you can do that. Uh, we have a few customers, more than a few, probably a few dozen uh, that either sell it to their their mother or their sister or their local church or, you know, they, they net meter it that way without agreement. But there are some people who have come up with personal agreements and say, you know, I'm going to send you this much power and you just pay me this on a monthly basis. Okay. Yep. Perfect. So it, it um, I know that works sort of as a community shared solar sort of uh, arrangement, yep. but it can also work resident to resident or homeowner. Sure. Sure. Homeowner. That's between the residents yep. themselves. There's no, yep. you know, that's your own agreements. Yeah. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Greg. This, this has been really interesting. Um, Two, I guess two questions, comments. Um, to Martha's M Martha's point, yeah, I mean, I think that the PACE program sounds like a good one. I also know that UMass 5 and others do provide, or at least I know that UMass 5 provides low solar loans, low for specifically for lower income folks and and um they have different interest rates and different systems associated with them of course all of this means that you own a home and you have credit so like that's still a barrier for many people um so one question is just how do we how do we deal with particularly in amherst right we have a lot of homes that are owned and then occupied by renters what's an opportunity to um, get those houses put so is it just the will of the landlord or is there some other way we can we can motivate there um my other comment is just on the so we got solar on our home in 2018 and i think we covered 80 percent of our average load um and i didn't think at the time that in 2022, I would have gotten heat pumps and an electric car, right? So now we're not <laughs> there. Um, and because of the fire code, we can't add to our our solar. So I'm wondering if your advice has, and it, maybe it has given that you, you also provide um, heat pumps, but has your advice changed at all for people getting solar to think about, you know, these other electrification potentials that are coming down the pipe? Um, yeah, of course it has. Uh, and I'll address a couple of things. Uh, UMass five has different loans, but they only have one solo loan and it isn't income based. The only real income based loan that was out there was the most successful one was the, actually the, the mass solar loan that was run by the state, uh, that was subsidized. And that was a highly successful program that had really good benefits for low income households. And we were able to really move that forward. Um, they haven't looked at that since. Um, to dress, whenever we have a customer that comes in and wants to look at solar, um, depending on how their house is situated and how it is, if you have a house with a very large roof that's facing direct south with no obstructions, you've won the lottery when it comes to electrifying your home. I mean, load it up. Load it up as much as you can. That's you know the the first purchase is the best purchase on that. And what we do with most customers now is we have those conversations up front because we believe, um, and I think that we all should, is that the path forward is through clean energy electrification of households, um, electric cars, mini splits, solar storage. That's the way it's going to be now. Where storage was, or where solar was 10 years ago, very expensive, storage is also going to be coming down. 
So right now, when you're looking at storage, it's an expensive proposition. In the future, it's not going to be. So what we counsel all of our clients is start with your power plant. Put that personal power plant on your roof. Learn to live with it. Learn how it works. Learn how much energy it provides. Learn how to adapt your lifestyle around it. And then start looking at introducing these other products into your lifestyle, whether it be the EV first. We sell car chargers also or whether it's air source heat pumps, uh, and then build those into it with the idea that what you want to do with your household, if you can, given the size of your roof and the current production available, you can transition to a pretty fossil fuel lifestyle. Your transportation, your heating, your electrical is done. So we always tell people up front to think about the future and not what's right now. Great. Thanks so, for the correction on the loan. Yeah. And Craig, I want to add to that one one uh, thing that you alluded to before, but I, I'm going to pitch that you put this into your homeowner pitch as well, which is uh, the load reduction um, as far as coupling the solar, the heat pumps, but also coupling it with weatherization, potentially energy retrofits, deep energy retrofits even, which still... Um, I think have a place um, that and because once your heating and cooling go onto the grid, you really need to reduce uh, your heat loss through envelope upgrades as, as part of that package. I think that's the kind of the that's the renewables, the mechanicals and the envelope. Those things really need to, to go together. So I'm going to just I, I know you were, had mentioned that before, but I wanted to. Yeah, no, it's it's really important. Reinforce that concept. Ma yeah, Mass Save has incredible rebates for air source heat pumps. So if you're doing a whole home retrofit, depending on your income basis, it starts at ten thousand and it can go up to sixteen thousand uh, for a rebate, a cash rebate. They send you a check. So if you're spending twenty thousand on air source heat pumps, you're going to get fifty percent back in a check. But to do that, you have to have a home energy audit. And you have to do any upgrades in excess of $1,000 to tighten the envelope and to improve your insulation quality. So whenever we're doing the air source heat pumps and we're doing the rebates for the clients, they all have to have their home energy audit first before they can apply for the rebates. So we're ensuring that that happens before we go in with the air source heat pumps. So I think it's a very smart move on the state's part to require that prior to the introduction of those. Of course, you can just have the air source heat pumps installed and not apply for the rebates, but we haven't had maybe one customer out of a hundred that has actually done that, where they just wanted their bedroom to be cool in the, in the summertime. Just throw an air conditioner up there. I don't want to worry about it. Um, but for the most part, you know, and we've done a lot of whole home retrofits this year. Um, I would say in excess of a hundred. Um, and all those had prior mass uh, the the mass energy auto sun and the insulation improvements if required. I had a question um, that might come up for people who'll be watching this in the future. That's slate roofs. Are you able to mount solar panels on roofs that are covered in slate shingles? We. Don't. <laughs> there are companies that do. Ah. We have tried, but typically it's incredibly expensive um, mm -hmm. because you really can't walk on slate roofs because you just, depending on the age, you can just crack them all up. Um, and they're, it's tricky because future leaks, you know, the mounting hardware, all that, it's just, you know, that's kind of complicated, but no, we don't. There are some companies that do them. So yeah. You can find them. Stephanie, then Stella. Greg, you said that you all are doing um, heat pump installations now too. So if a home already has solar installed, will you all come in and just do the heat pump portion? Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, the, our primary advertising and focus is on our current customers. We have close to 2,800 customers in the Valley. 
Um, so we're marketing to them directly uh, because this is a natural transit. I mean, our company is, is actually pretty focused on the electrification of homes. Um, and, and when we were actually approach, approached by the Mass Save group about three years ago, when they were coming out with this program to say, we want a solar company to start installing air source heat pumps because it's the natural thing to do. You know, you can offset the electrical expense with solar. So could you please consider this? So we did, and we became part of what they call the heat pump installers network, which is something you have to take courses on and qualify for. So we're a part of the heat pump installers network now as a part of the mass that chooses uh, climate goals. Thanks. It's my turn. I just had a question. I had a question. It's um, maybe a little bit off topic of, of affording solar, but it's related to, I think, Laura's uh, COP experience and also stuff we've talked about in this committee in the past, which is how do you think the solar industry is doing right now at incorporating women into blue collar electrification jobs that they've historically kind of been excluded from? I think it's honestly, um, the trades is suffering. There isn't a lot of people going into trades, men or women. Um, electricians are very hard to find. And we've homegrown all of ours. Um, we started out with two electricians. They spent five years training their apprentices. We had four electricians. Then they had four electrician, four apprentices. And now we've got, you know, that number of electricians. So we've homegrown all of our own electricians. And there honestly isn't a lot of women in the trades. Uh, we do have women on our staff. They don't work in the field so much. Um, but it is something that's more at a academic level than it is our level. Uh, we're totally open to it. We're totally open to having women in the trades, but uh, it's just very difficult to find right now. Yes, yeah, Steve. So another question is, I think to the um, uh, Massachusetts sort of statewide with goals for putting solar on rooftops, they're pretty ambitious, at least in the amount of technical potential that has been identified. Um, what What's your sense like around Amherst? What percentage of residential homes are have rooftops that are suitable for solar? Oh, I think we did this before when we did Solarize and I was thinking it was, it wasn't a lot. I would say it's around 35 to 38%, if I remember correctly. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of, it's got to be facing kind of south, east, or west, right. or in that general direction, and it can't be covered with trees. Um, and so that's historically what you see just about anywhere. Um, so I would say that, but saying that also, of that 38% or whatever the number may be, you probably have an adoption rate of less than 10%, maybe 15%. Um, yeah, so that's taking there was the economic factors and other things into account. Yeah, I don't I don't know period. if if for a lot of people, solar isn't like the first thing they think of. I mean, right. we get a lot of people who look at it and say, I don't want that thing attached to my house. I don't know what that thing is. I don't know what it's supposed to do. But all <laughs> I do know is I don't want it attached to my house. Um, so you get that. Um, so there isn't everybody who understands completely yet, even, you know, a decade later the benefits of it. Hmm. Dwayne. Yeah, just expanding on that a little bit, Greg. Um, and I, I think you mentioned, or I think Northeast Solar does do some small commercial um, installations as well. I'm just wondering your experience um, and sort of what you see, uh, sort of the difference and, and the barriers associated with <coughs> um, installing solar on larger rooftops, commercial rooftops. Um, we have some in Amherst, lots in Hadley. Um, and and um, just your experience in terms of what some of those barriers techni technically or, or business uh, are 
uh, in terms of approaching uh, and looking at that sector as well? Yeah, what we find the biggest barrier, um, we do a lot with agricultural because they have big barns and so they, they're they ideal for installing solar on. What you'll find in small commercial especially is that there is a smaller footprint with a lot happening in it. And a lot of times uh, either manufacturers or businesses um, have a lot of roof penetrations, duct work, air conditioning units, everything else. It kind of breaks up the rooftop and it makes it very difficult to install solar. Um, Northampton had a real big push to try to do as much as they could downtown. But if you actually look at Google Maps and Google Earth and look at those rooftops, it's just all cut up. I mean, it's there's, you can fit very small panels on there. On the larger roofs, um, there are a lot of benefit, um, but it's a very aggressive market. Um, and it's also, it gets a little bit more complicated because the larger you get, the more utility um, cooperation you need to have about how to install it because you get very large power plants on people's roofs. Uh, it can do a lot. Uh, there's a lot of consideration to be made with the utility on it. So we focus on the smaller stuff. Um, and with the smaller stuff, we find that those businesses that aren't traditional older type of buildings are much better. And whenever we get a new commercial client, we always encourage them to build south and large, um, <laughs> you know, to, to do what they can. All right. I'm going to ask a question. Um, trees. Uh, Stella is our local tree expert. Um, one of the thing, one of the topics that she's brought to the group and that I've witnessed myself as well is the sort of the advice to cut down a tree or to not cut down a tree. And I'm just curious how any advice for, for people, I'll give myself as an example. I have solar. It does not produce as well as it used to. I've got this row of red pines. Uh, they, man, they go up fast. And I've yeah, they lost, do. I've lost a lot so, of production, but the cost to take them down, it wouldn't pay for itself in electricity. So how do you think about trees um, and how do you advise your clients? So I've got an 8KW solar array on my house that produces about 5,000 kilowatts a year because I have this big oak right next to my house that shades my house during the summertime. And I couldn't cut it down. Um, trees do a better job sequestering carbon than we do offsetting it. <clears throat> so it's for every client, it's a conversation. Uh, we do more trimming than we do cutting. Uh, but for some customers who want to transition their home, and I, I put a series of blog posts up on our website about my transition, um, where you can hear about the tree and my air source heat pumps and the solar and everything else. So you get an idea of what it looks like. But um, that's a real conversation because a lot of people don't, don't want to remove the trees and other people do want to remove the trees. So it's a cost consideration in that. Um, and that just adds to it. But Overall, I think the people that elect to do trees are doing it because they're looking for that transition. They're looking to transition to renewable energy. They're looking to transition to heat pumps, looking to transition to electric cars, and they get it. So that expense or that removal of those trees is that important to them. Um, and how they utilize that waste wood is another decision-making process for them. I appreciate the the uh, the five thousand kilowatt hours on the eight kilowatt system. That's your that was a very vulnerable moment for you to share that. I, it's great. <laughs> yep, couldn't get rid of the oak. That's wonderful. It's got a couple of nice um, little squirrels that live there every year. We got this one knot, and every year I can plan on this squirrel that currently lives in there. We got half a year now having a fight in that hole to protect her nest. <laughs> So he's been there for about four years now. And, uh, and what's the payback on the squirrel? So, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you, you mentioned that with some lease agreements, there's a stipulation that if a tree in your yard grows up and starts to shade the system that they could ask you to trim it or cut it down. 
what happens if a neighbor's tree grows up in that sort of a situation? I assume nothing. I, I, don't, I, I don't think they can do anything. Yeah. Um, they, I, I don't know if there's any penalties in there, but I know that I had two neighbors in my development here uh, that had to remove trees because they had lease systems on their property. Um, also understand that the companies that sell these financing agreements, these PPAs, there's for the, the companies, there's the tax credit and there's also the depreciation from a business expense. And after that six year window of look back on depreciation benefit, they bundle all these leases together into financial tranches and they sell these tranches to third party investors. So they're completely out at this point. The original investors in the solar are completely out. They've gotten this investor money. So now your solar array is owned by somebody else or another investment group. And their return is based solely upon the projections that the original financing company gave them. So they're the ones that typically step in and go, wait a minute, this system was supposed to produce you know, 5,000 kilowatt hours a year and it's only producing 35. And they have a tech come out and they look at it and go, oh, it's got a big shade tree. And they go, okay, cut it down because we want five. Not 35. Sorry, and is that it, cutting it down? Is that at the at the homeowner's expense? Homeowner, the homeowner's you, expense. Okay, gotcha. It's in it's in That's the lease easy agreement. for them to say. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. That's in the yeah, 20 yeah, in pages the that you signed. I, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's 625. But this has been super uh informative and enjoyable. Um I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I want to, I wonder if we should button up any last questions and then do our closing, uh, uh items for our, our meeting. Um, so we all, we can end at six at our scheduled six thirty time. Oh, Don, here we go. Last question. No, what happened? You're muted. You're muted, Don. You guys did the solar installation in our home about eight years ago um, on on Bay Road, but it's it's a it's a tracker um, and yep. not um, not on a rooftop. Um, and I realize that that requires open space, which which we actually have. Do you install many trackers? By the way, we love it. It's wonderful. So, <laughs> yeah, trackers are a moving part. So I have a love kind of question on those but you know we're there to take care of it if you need it but yes we still install trackers um it's still something for people like you that have a nice open space it's ideal you can get almost one and a half times the production out mm -hmm. of the same footprint and it's amazing yeah wow. Jesse, well, i just want to give the public a last opportunity to to ask a question yeah, um, I know Martha's, but we have another member of the public. If you're interested in asking a question, please feel free to raise your hand electronically while we still have Greg with us. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for giving me the time. I hope it was productive for you. I've always liked doing these because I feel it's still important. And I can thank Dwayne a lot for his early stewardship in this. Uh, he got us started in a lot of this and Stephanie for getting us in Amherst. So always appreciative. Great yeah, to have you, thank Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Wonderful. Greg. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, you good too. Night. The mini Drucker. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, member updates, next agenda, public comment adjourn in three minutes. I think we don't have any member updates. Does anyone have any updates? Good job. Um, next agenda, Lori and Stephanie and I can make that, right? Anything anyone's got on their mind that they want to make sure hits it? It'll be heat pump, solar. I think Don mentioned something about the pace follow-up from me going to MMA. And then I think maybe a follow-up on the transportation. Great. Yeah, um, I hope to have intel from the driving schools and um, yeah. 
public comment. Well, thank you both and the third who's left for coming. I hope you enjoyed Craig's presentation. Um, I'm gonna move to adjourn this meeting at the wonderful time of 6.28 p.m. I don't think we, Steve seconds that. And, I'll second. Uh, it probably needs to be verbal. Does it need to be verbal? I'll second. I, I will second that, even though I don't think we normally go through those motions to adjourn a meeting. I, it's just fun. I love the red tape. <laughs> I was just giving you that encouragement, uh, Jesse, as your great job you're doing tonight. Thank you. I really just, just milking the, the last everybody. two minutes to get to 630. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, the power, you all know the power goes to my head when I run these meetings. So <laughs> I appreciate, oh, speaking of power, just went there. <laughs> Steve, Steve move. needs to move. <laughs> Steve needs to do a dance. <laughs> the previous advice to heart here. There we go. Well, we'll have a. He's in his office, not in his house. <laughs> have a warm and, and wonderful night, everybody. Hey. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Good night, everybody.